my name is Mike Delaney. Um, I'm 12 years of age. I've been living inside in this car brown dump for like um, my whole here. life. Over here, dump. Yeah, my whole life I've been living here for. Still no changes. Can't, yeah, yeah, no changes around here. We were supposed to stay here for 18 months, but that was like 15 years ago. Yeah, the council isn't really doing anything. Like this, this, this has, this has to be stopped. Like, and it, and it can't keep carrying on. Like, um, we're still waiting. Still waiting. And yeah, hoping. Yeah, yeah, hoping, hoping, yeah. My name is Mrs. Margaret Delaney. I'm 15 years living in the Car Brown. The council put us in here 15 years ago. We're still here. We don't hear nothing from the council. We send them a phone call, they won't even answer us back. I, have, I lost my husband four years ago. I live here with all my children, my grandchildren, and there's still nothing getting done for us. The smell that comes from that dump is not right on it. I'm 50. I'm 48 years married and I'm still fighting for I want my life where I can live happy. My sister lives here beside me too with all her family and all her grandchildren. Children here is getting sick because of the smell of the dump and because council won't come out to help us. There's nothing getting done here, nothing. Winter time is the coldest time in the world here. We're fighting for to get a good place to live. There's nothing here, nothing yet coming up here for us. We're still waiting on the long finger. The tunnel's in here, turn away the keys and they make it back. They forgot to come back, see how we were. Have a staring night here, it's very, very bad. Winter time is ridiculous in here. So I heard in the small children and the old people. Please, if you can help us. And I'm speaking for every traveller out here, more than myself here. Everyone needs to be helped. My name is Angela Delaney and I'd be one of the mothers living on the Halton site for the past 12 years. I have had five kids on this site, this is all our children knows. We were 11 years on this site living with rat infestation, with the smell, with the fumes. We've only recently been given a welfare unit which we had asked that we didn't want, that we wanted proper homes for the kids, that they didn't have to be going inside and outside in the height of winter to have to use the toiletries, having to go out to the kitchen for a sup of milk, like everything basically is still living outdoors. Um, the smell here is completely very, very bad, as you already know yourself. We're living on a landfill, and not just are we living, living on the landfill, we're looking at the dump. The amount of toxic fumes that comes out in the air here is not fair to the kids and it's not fair to us. We've brought this up many, many times, and still the council has refused to house and accommodate the families here. It's not fair to the children. Our children is isolated. They go to school, they come home, and they're looking at a dump into their face, and they've nowhere to play. They've no green fields around them. They don't have a park. It's just not fair to the kids. It's practically, we're living not just in a dump, or we're living in a prison. We mightn't have 24 foot walls around us, but we are living in a prison for our kids, and it's not good enough, and it's not fair. Mary? My name is Mary Delaney. I'm living here for the last 13 years. I have five kids in this halting site. Um, this halting site is very bad health. The smell, as Angela said, the flies, the bees. Um, it is a very, it's a very hard place to live when you have kids. Uh, some mornings there we got up for our children to go to school and the kids couldn't have had a breakfast here. The smell comes in the windows. We often had to drive into the garage to get some food for the kids to go to school. And I have two or three little kids there that have gastritis in their stomach. They're suffering with their stomachs. And myself, I'm suffering on that my own stomach from the smell that's coming from the burner waste. And it is really a health hazard here for people. Mm -hmm. All we want, like, is just somewhere appropriate and right to live. Our kids is constantly suffering severe migraines, gastro in the stomach. Their complexion is completely pale compared to the other children in school because the air that we're breathing in is actually toxic fumes. We're not getting the clean fresh air that our children should be getting. They're not getting that. They haven't got proper... There's nothing out here for a child. There's nothing healthy about the site. 
We've reached out many, many times with the council to come out and meet with the family, sit down urgently. We did fight. We took part in many campaigns and we fought very, very hard with the council. I took part in the campaign back in 2017. I've met with numerous people, high people, that supposedly was going to help make a difference with the travellers. To be honest, traveller ignicity might have been passed, but traveller still hasn't got the rights. As far as I'm concerned, which is, I should not... As far as I'm concerned, the travellers is not treated equally. We're still treated like garbage because it's how they're making us feel. They refuse to meet with us face to face. Their money is there. It should be used and it should be used in the right way. And the family should have a say in where they're allowed to live. Like in all fairness, we've lived among this completely for years and years. No per person in their right mind has a mental state of health living in conditions we've lived in. We are all affected. And eventually, we don't know how our health is going to deteriorate in the next five years. All we want is somewhere right and suitable and we'll kindly get off this. We'd side. like whoever can help make a difference among the travellers have seen the conditions that we live in, that when it finally comes, when the, tra when the council finally acknowledges the families are in desperate need out here in the Caroline Houghton site, to sit down face to face and, tr and treat us equally like they should be doing. And we should have a say in where we would like to live and how we'd like our kids to live. They didn't acknowledge us in the past 15 years of our life. They should be able to acknowledge us now. People's mental health has been affected out here. We've all been scarred from the conditions that we live on. And we, as the 15, 13 families on the Caroline Houghton site, we back the Traveller Homes give us 21. How more we're going to be here as well, isn't it? Yeah. We just need answers from the council. I support the Traveller Homes complaint and I just want a, a clean, safe, suitable home for my children. I back the Traveller Homes campaign, Traveller Now Homes campaign. And we just want um, the council to stand up once and for all and start accommodating the families within the Caroline Houghton side. And we should have a choice. We should be able to sit down and we should be able to have a say on where we're willing to live. We just want a bit of safe haven for our kids, somewhere clean and healthy. And for someone in the council, there's enough, there's enough um, grants for the traveller. The traveller money is there. It's not being spent. It's being sit ba sent back. We've done, everybody knows the conditions that's in this site. It's clear as day for everyone to see. We need someone within the council walls to stand up and say enough is enough. We're willing to help these families. And I think we're entitled to that by now. OK, so I think we can, <clears throat> we can all agree that there's some very powerful um, testimonies um, heard there. And I suppose for me, one of the the very sad things ab about hearing those <coughs> is that we heard similar testimonies four years ago um, when the campaign was launched. Um, you know, and I was really struck by one of the comments in um, one of the clips around living in a prison. Um, and it wasn't a prison with 24 foot walls around it. It's a prison of poor accommodation, of lack of respect, of not being listened to. Um, and in some ways, a prison of hopelessness about what kind of quality of life can the children in those clips hope for? Um, and in some ways, I, I think sometimes we talk about human rights as if these are just kind of abstract legal words, as opposed to rights that human beings possess. Um, and that is, it's sometimes it's nearly easy to forget to see um, these rights as something that affect um, human beings. I can fairly confidently say as a central person that if these were issues that were affecting my daughter or my brother or my sister or my niece or my, my nephew, things might change. But because they're happening to members of a minority community where I don't have a sister, where I don't have a brother, where I don't have a niece, where I don't have a nephew, um, it's in some way it's easy to ignore them. Um, and the last point I'll say on it is in some ways it seems like Irish society is um, particularly good at ignore or finding reasons to ignore particularly the rights of minorities um, mm -hmm. and in fact not only will we find reasons to ignore them we'll find justifications to ignore them um, and once we finish with the justifications to ignore them then we'll start blaming the people in those minority communities themselves and I think that's an issue maybe that we'll come back to um, as we go along is to what extent do people who live in conditions that have just been described end up in some ways being blamed themselves because of the conditions but we'll come back to that um, as we go on so we just move into our next session now um, and we are spot on time i really like that um where um Anne marie and and Anne marie are, uh, my co-chair and nora cochran are going to give a bit of an update um on progress on the traveler um the traveler homes now campaign over to you Anne marie thank you chris
necessary now, if we want. Sorry, I'm just bringing up my presentation. Just while we're waiting for Anne Marie to bring up the presentation, um, maybe people should feel free to add in reactions to those testimonies, your own reactions in the chat as well. It would be good to see those, I think, as we as we go along through the through the afternoon. And also just to remind for those of us that are on social media, there's a number of hashtags, Traveller Homes Now, Traveller Homes Matter. You can see those in the chat as well. If you want to add comment on Twitter or on Facebook or your social media platform of choice. Sorry, now I'm just having some technical difficulties here. I wonder if, if Nora is ready, we could possibly start with Nora and Marie if you wanted while you're okay. Uh, yeah, yeah Nora, would you be ready to i'm ready for this. okay well if you go for it there and um yeah. and then we can come back to Anne marie okay thank you chris and Anne marie and and hello hello everyone uh, my name is Nora corcoran and i am a project worker with the goa travel movement i also a mature student with a ba in business enterprise and community development so from a personal and a professional um aspect you know i i've seen to the full extent exactly what the families are going through. And, and the Galway Travel Movement have been supporting and advocating on behalf of the travel community in Galway and Sydney County for many years, which we've highlighted to our Traveller Homes Now campaigns. And now here to say is we prepare to launch our fourth monitoring report about the persisting inequalities and inequities suffered by the community for far too long. And today we stand in solidarity with the traveller community as we call on the leaders within the government to reform the systems that are currently not working and are failing the traveller community and the children of our community. And these systems need to offer full legal protection for the traveller community. And we stand together to, to, to fight for provision of culturally appropriate accommodation and to highlight overcrowding and homelessness. As statistics show on a snapshot taken in September 2019 and documented by Paddy Point in 2021, that travellers accounted for a disproportionate 50% of families presenting as homeless. And the census 2016 showed how nearly two in five Irish family households had more persons than rooms compared to with less than 6% of all households. We continue to fight, out stamp, to fight to stamp out discrimination against the travellers when trying to access private accommodation. And to let the government know how social exclusion and its isolation has had a detrimental effect on both the physical and mental health of the traveller community, who, according to the All-Ireland Traveller Health Study, has higher rates of anxiety and depression and a suicide rate that is six times higher than general population. And we also demand that traveller voices be heard and members invited to be a part of the decision making when those decisions are about tra the traveller community in relation to accommodation. As the failure in policy regarding the provision of timely and suitable accommodation for the members of the traveller com community exacerbates the mental health crisis further. The traveller community are in the depths of a major accommodation crisis. And four years on from the first monitoring report launched by the Goa Traveller Movement, families are still forced to live in overcrowded, inhumane housing conditions. And there are families who have to live on the side of the road who are lacking the essential but basic amenities to keep them safe and healthy. And all families living on the side of the road were highlighted as being at risk by GTM in April 2020 during the first COVID lockdown. Minimal interventions took place, and there remains a lack of urgency in housing the most vulnerable of those identified. And GTM are regularly in contact with the families living on the side road and have noticed, as we've seen in the videos, the stress, anxiety, frustration being felt by the families. And some families have, have expressed a decline and in their mental health status due to the, the living conditions and the feeling of being forgotten about by the local authorities. And with respect, we acknowledge that the local authorities have, um, have been impacted. You know, the services have been impacted negatively in the last few years due to the pandemic. However, the failure to meet the accommodation needs of the travel community happened over the course of three traveller accommodation plans. And these plans have made limited provision for providing traveller specific accommodation. And least of all, to those families still forced to live in that bog, which used to have a dump nearby. 
And by local authorities not recognising the need for traveller specific accommodation, the danger is that it becomes an assimilationist policy where people are forced into houses. And through these assimilationist policies, there is a denial of people's nomadic identity to the homogenising of the traveller population. And four years on from our first report, families are still being forced to live in substandard halting sites. And one particular halting site, as Angela and Mary said, is situated beside a waste facility where children are going to school hungry because their stomachs feel sick at the noxious smells coming from that waste facility. And four years later, Angela is still on that site. Her family has grown by two. And that is two more pregnancies where she was overpowered by nausea because of the revolting smell of the waste being delivered daily next door. And the family being subjected to further years in fear for her children's safety in a site that's infested with rats, flies, open sewage and a faulty, faulty electrical supply. In 2014, the government of Ireland signed up the Healthy Ireland Framework. And the framework has four key goals to increase the proportion of people who are healthy at all stages of life, to reduce health inequalities, and to protect the public from threats to health and well-being, and to create an environment where every individual and sector of society can play their part in achieving a healthy Ireland. Well, living in substandard sites and accommodation is like living in an alternate reality, where the key goals outlined in the framework are reversed or don't seem to apply. And by denying the traveller community the right to adequate and traveller-specific accommodation, all government departments, agencies, and other institutions that shape the everyday environment around us should take into consideration the negative impact their work, policy, or development will have on the physical and mental health of the population it serves. And furthermore, there seems to be little consideration given by the, by the local authorities as to how the interactions of their staff may cause stress or anxiety to members of community who are well documented as having increased levels of mental health difficulties in comparison to the general population. And in July 2021, the Galway Traveller Movement hosted our first Built Homes, Built Health, Built Hope event as part of our Traveller Homes Now campaign to highlight these persisting inequalities and inequities suffered by a community, by the community when trying to access adequate accommodation. And this event welcomed two keynote speakers, Dr. Michael Ryan, Executive Director of the World Health Organization's Health Emergency Program, and Dr. Aileen Kitchen, a consultant in public health medicine, who both spoke about the, how the social determinants of health show that the conditions in which people live and work and where children play can help or destroy their health. And Dr. Ryan spoke about how implicit bias and lack of implementation of the public sector duty, 2014, is evident in the treatment of the members of the travel community. And this is patently obvious as we witness the substandard and inadequate accommodation that our community is forced to live, live in, which is having a serious effect on their mental and physical health. Therefore, if we, are to, if we are to see real change for the traveller community in accessing adequate accommodation, the social determinants need to be addressed urgently and holistically by national and local government leaders. We're still in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic and in the second wave, over a thousand members of the traveling community in Golden City and, and County were affected, and in particular vulnerable people with disabilities, people with underlying health conditions and children, as many families had no room to social distance or isolate, and in a lot of cases lacked the privilege of warm running water and sanitary facilities to protect them against COVID-19. But COVID-19 did not cause the problems faced by the traveling community when trying to stay safe. What the pandemic did was highlight to humanitarian crisis the stark conditions and inequalities faced by our community with no safe place to live. And it's no longer good enough to have temporary solutions like sending in a water tank or installing a port loo. Today we call on the government and Galway City and Council as we demand the traveller community be allowed the freedom of traveller culture and traditions to the creation of more traveller specific housing, adequate halting sites and an easier access to accommodation. Our children need a safe place to play, not just a green patch. And according to a study that was undertaken by Play Scotland in April 2020 on the impact of COVID-19 on play and childcare settings in Scotland showed that the impact of COVID-19 on children and families, mental health and well-being was a major concern. Respondents highlighted the impact restrictions on children's play indoors and outdoors and their health and well-being. Children's social needs not being met and the lack of structure in children's lives. The report tells us how there needs to be particular attention paid to, paid to encouraging play and supporting children's social and emotional well-being at this are time. Are you on now? Where are you? Playing is important because children need to, see you. to survive. Play is an enhancing experience which fosters resilience, the ability to handle stress, challenges and setbacks. 
just playing can help build children's capacity to cope with highly stressful situations. But children living on substandard sites and in a trailer on the side of the road have to adapt and grow up without learning some of these skills due to the lack of an appropriate child friendly play area, which in turn leads to mental health and anxiety issues as they transition from child to adolescent issues they have to deal with lifelong. The Traveller Accommodation Act 1998 put policies in place for traveller appropriate accommodation, but the traveller accommodation plan is not enough. Local authorities are not allocating accommodation equally and have failed the traveling community for too long with the underspended funds and the denial of traveller homes. And this equality against the traveling community in Galway City and County, which is against our human rights, has to stop now. And Dr. Ryan also spoke about institutional and systemic racism and ethnic bias and how you are judged by who you are and where you come from. The traveller community has suffered generations of this racism bias. We're exiled to the marriage society, pushed to breaking point. But we have a message to send out today. We are not broken and we are not going away. Our community is strong, but a never ending resilience that gives us the capacity to highlight the injustices of the past, challenge the injustice of the present, so that we can hope for a better, safer, healthier future for our children, but culturally appropriate accommodation to keep our heritage and traditions alive, to be passed on to future generations of our community. Thank you very much. Thanks, Anne Marie. That was very powerful. Um... Oh, sorry. Thanks, Nora. Sorry, getting getting get, getting ahead of myself. Um, and Marie, are we ready to go back to? Yeah, I'm to ready you? now, Chris. Excellent. Great. Go for it. Okay. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, this presentation uh, is in relation to the Traveller Homes Now Accommodation Inquiry, and members of the Traveller community are calling for immediate action. And the presentation content is uh, the progress or lack of progress that has been made from 2017 to the 2021 uh, campaign demands and the current standard of existing accommodation in Galway City and County and the action for change and realizing Traver human rights and an end to the violations. Um, the right to adequate housing applies to everyone individuals as well as families are entitled to adequate housing regardless of their age, their economic status, their group or other affiliation or status and any such factors. In other words, there should be no discrimination in the provision of adequate housing and the UN Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, that, that quote was taken from there. And under human rights law, the Irish state is not a neutral actor. It is a duty bearer with an obligation to take positive action to realize the economic, social and cultural rights of the traveler community. To this end, the traveler community in Galway City and County, as the rights holder, will lay out the issues and our demands for change that are needed urgently. Also, there is a peer-led review was carried out on the 18 sites from June to August of 2021, and traveller testimonies were gathered, photographic and video documentation compiled. I rocked this committee on key issues affecting the traveller community. Visit to Galway City sites was facilitated, and this picture shows uh, women on the Halton site in the Car Brown, um, just that they really want change and they want to have their voices heard and hopefully this campaign will bring this to light. Um, first of all we're going to talk about the denial of rights and the denial of traveller cultural rights and an inequality at all levels and the demand in this instance is to treat members of the traveller community with respect and dignity and the progress to date, this is difficult to measure, but the testimonies would indicate that this is not happening. And secondly, a demand is to meet the targets within the traveler accommodation plan. And the progress to date in this incident, will taps from 2018 to 23 are at the midterm review and the provision of traveler specific accommodation in the city is not on target. The targets set out in both city and county tap are under ambitious, 
there is no provision made in the county tap for the development of the new traveller specific accommodation. And thirdly, respect the demand is the respect for the traveller perspective and voice in decision making. And the traveller representatives on the LTACC do not feel that their perspectives are valued. Limited access to participation in meaningful shared decision making. And a culturally appropriate accommodation. All accommodation must meet international and national standards. Sorry, I've skipped over there. Sorry, I'll go back. Sorry, I'm actually going to write. Sorry there, I've uh, just uh, a glitch there. Excuse me. And secondly, to ensure that all le legislation protects the traveller community's ethnicity and cultural rights. And this protection is not in place. And the demand traveller children's rights to a home protected. And this protection is not afforded to traveller children. Thirdly, an end to discrimination and implement the public sector duty. Direct and indirect discrimination happens on a daily basis, and an equal status audit was carried out by IRA across all, all local authorities in 2019 with varied results. Implementation of the public sector duty is very slow. And secondly, a violation of rights, the lack of culturally appropriate accommodation for members of the traveller community. Traveller specific accommodation built as a matter of urgency in Galway City and County. And the progress to, to date, there is no urgency when it comes to the provision of culturally appropriate specific uh, accommodation and most travellers give up and concede to take a house. Uh, and the demand, secondly, is to transient, transient sites established across Galway City and County. No progress in this area. The name transient sites and Galway City is being used to accommodate families on a permanent basis. The County Galway name transient site is located in a very isolated rural area with poor infrastructure and limited access to amenities. And but thirdly, this demand is provision of mobile homes, chalets as or, or chalets as part of traveller specific cultural rights. And the progress to date is very poor progress in, in the area in Galway City and County. Requests were made for 10 replacement mobiles in 2020 and 2021 due to COVID and living and congregated spaces. None were replaced, Rep permission sought for for four at the 2021 City Council budget meeting and the roadside families asked for support after storm damage to their mobiles uh, in 2020, but this was not forthcoming. Also, um, the culturally appropriate and the demand for all accommodation must meet international and uh, and national standards. Standards are not being met on the current city council sites. The county council have recently refurbished three traveller specific sites, so are compliant in relation to the provision of bricks and mortar. However, in the, in the main, the traveller families do not benefit from joined up thinking. The provision is fragmented and serves only to keep people living in unacceptable conditions. No impact assessments are carried out in relation to traveller children's needs. Uh, and secondly, a meaningful participation is the demand of the traveller community in the design and delivery of traveller specific accommodation. And to date, this is not consistent 
across Galway City and County, and results speak louder than words. And, and or thirdly, a vi the violation of rights is overcrowding and homelessness. The demand is design travel accommodation to accommodate larger families and provide more accommodation for young travel families. And no culturally appropriate accommodation available for travel families who are living in travel specific accommodation and need of homeless services. Secondly, a demand to end evictions and offer solutions to overcrowding. There was a ban on eviction during COVID, no substantive solutions to overcrowding, and traveller families overrepresented in homeless services. IRAC and ESRI found that the traveller community are the most at risk of being homeless, while also experiencing the highest levels of discrimination. And thirdly, an appropriate accommodation must be accessible and meet cultural needs. And to date, no intercultural planning within homeless services. There is a lack of emergency accommodation in the city and county, and traveller families are spending inhumane times in emergency services, and provision of accommodation for members of the traveller community remains insufficient. And fourthly, lack of accountability, a demand for sanctions for underspend of traveller specific funding and failure to meet traveller accommodation programme targets. No sanctions were imposed and demand the decision making powers in relation to planning for traveller specific accommodation removed from local authority level. And recommendation from the review of the 1998 Housing Act to set up an independent agency to deliver on traveller accommodation. There is no final decision yet to date. And thirdly, an overhaul of the local traveller accommodation consultative committee. Review carried out in Galway City in 2019-2020. LTACC reconstructed in Galway City communication protocol developed in Galway City, an independent chairperson selected, call for protocol to be developed in Galway City Council. There is a long road to travel in relation to meaningful collaboration. And fourthly, training in cultural comp competency to be all undertaken by local authorities, city and uh, county. And the progression is outstanding in both Galway City and, count and County. And the current, uh, the current standard of existing accommodation, we want to be fair to the, to the council and local authorities. Therefore, we want to take you through some of the actions that have taken place since 2017. We, we acknowledge that the impact of COVID on the delivery of services. However, much more collaboration must be done between local authorities and the traveler community. So the Traveller Accommodation uh, Programme from 2019 to 2024 was developed, notwithstanding the targets are under ambitious and they were not equal, equality proofed. In 2019, a review of the LTACC was carried out and a training workshop was organised, delivered by Niall Crowley and Marie, Maria Joyce. Communication protocol was developed, an independent chairperson was assigned in 2020. There have been changes to the structures in an attempt to deliver on traveller perspective accommodation. However, there are ongoing blocks delivering on the targets. Lack of access to land and the lack of political will to deliver on the targets continues to be problematic. An IRIC equality audit was carried out all be it without asking for the impact of the traveller organisations. Efforts were made to include an organisation in subsequent submissions. And the current standard of existing accommodation to follow, the subsequent benchmarks for the sites and group housing have not yet been made. New welfare units were installed 
on the temporary site. However, ongoing sewage issues exist. There is still no definitive plan to deliver traverse specific accommodation for the families. A heating system was installed on the transient sites in June 2021. However, families were left without water and heat for 18 months. There is no overall regeneration plan for the site. These sites are built in close proximity to a decommissioned dump and a large waste facility. Rodents and flies are an ongoing public health issue on the Headford Road sites. And units on the Tume Road and Bail Shroha site are not fit for purpose and lack of back doors, a fire hazard. Health and safety is a cause for serious concern on all sites. Mold and dampness still an issue in all the group housing in sites inclu including Kroshnikola, Kultra and Fawnetlas. There are no play facilities in any of the sites and Travert children's rights are not protected. Chronic overcrowding exists in St. Nicholas's halting site with a family of 10, two adults and eight children, all sharing a run room welfare unit. This is a picture now of a loving mother trying to raise her child in very, very poor and inadequate conditions. Also, the Traveller Accommodation Programme of 2019 to 2024 was developed notwithstanding that the targets are under ambitious and that they were not equality proved. The Crockwell site was fully renovated. Families are expressing satisfaction with their newly renovated site. Kalimer site was fully renovated. Canal Drive was renovated, but still experiencing difficulties. Kragan is due for redevelopment, but there are ongoing communication issues and offers of alternative accommodation does not meet their cultural needs. There are no adequate play facilities on any of the sites. Traveller children's rights are not protected. Benchmarks are still outstanding for Gort Bridge and Ballygar. They are scheduled in the TAP. IRAC Equality Audit was carried out albeit without asking for the input of the traveller organisations. And finally, six adults and six children residing on the road site were highlighted as being at risk by GTM in April 2020 during the first COVID breakout. Minimal interventions took place and these remains a lack of urgency in accommodation, the most vulnerable of those identified. GTM staff are regularly in contact with the families living on the roadside and have noted distress, anxiety and frustration being felt by families. Some families have expressed a decline in their mental health status due to their living conditions and the feeling of being forgotten about by the local authorities. And Finally, realizing traveller human rights, what was me, we do to end the violations? The account of the current standards are a sad reflection on Irish society. Traveller Homes Now campaign is calling for immediate state action and a whole new approach to delivery to include a deliberate intercultural, uh, intercultural approach. And what is that? What is interculturalism? It holds the belief that culture and equity are not just minority issues, but clearly majority issues. It sees the importance of assisting all people to become aware of their own culture and to remove the blinkers which hinder, hinders their ability to reflect on diversity issues. Most importantly, it includes acknowledging the need for critiquing racism and power relations and challenging stereotypes and racism. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. That's the presentation and progress to date. Thanks, Anne-Marie and, and Nora. Um, you know, I think what we've seen there is a kind of a, a fairly stark indictment of progress. And there is a more detailed report on this to follow. Um, but I think what comes across both from Nora and Anne-Marie's presentation is that progress clearly hasn't been enough. I'm just struck by a few things in the presentation. Um, Nora referenced leadership being needed. Um, but I suppose it's a particular type of leadership. It's leadership that is transformative, leadership that's risk-taking, um, leaders who are willing to disrupt 
Um, but we don't need now anymore. It's clear are more of managers, administrators, system maintainers. I'm not saying we don't need administrators. We don't need managers. But what we need are managers who are willing to lead um, and I'm just struck by a comment that the, the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, they did a review of the Irish public sector um, uh, reform plan from 2014 to 2016. It was published in 2017. And they said there are six key capacities needed in the Irish public sector. Um, and I'm going to share three of them that I think are particularly important. They say we need um, uh, people in the public sector with capacity of curiosity, of storytelling and insurgency. Now, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development is not known as being a radical organization. But when they're calling for our public sector um, employees to um, have capacities of insurgency, and that's telling us something, people who are willing to think differently and outside the box and disrupt. Um, I was struck by the reference to meeting targets. And I suppose the key thing here is, and this is something that the Human Rights Commission, Human Rights and Equality Commission did pick up in a number of their reviews. They said, oh yeah, well, okay, in some ways, the travel accommodation plan uh, targets in different local authorities have been met. But the problem was the targets weren't particularly ambitious in the first place, or else they have been met. And I was struck by one of the comments in the chat um, about assimilation. They have been met by providing accommodation only in standard housing. Um, now, you can say on paper those targets have been met, but that isn't necessarily meeting, or it is, certainly isn't meeting the target of providing um, culturally appropriate um, accommodation. So who sets targets is particularly important. And um, Anne-Marie mentioned the operation of the LTACCs, the Local Travel Accommodation Consultative Committees. Um, these are supposed to be collaborative processes. And collaborative governance is a big buzzword all over the world. But when you actually look to find really genuine, meaningful examples of collaboration that shares power, that genuinely shares understanding and shares decision making, it's very hard to come across. So it's a concept that is much in vogue, but in terms of practice, um, it struggles um, somewhat. Um, so I suppose the final point I'd say is, if we were looking at this in 20 years time, 30 years time, maybe what, what would a more enlightened society say? Will we be looking back in this um, time in the same way as we're now looking back in the treatment of women and children in the mothers and home um, scandal and previously in industrial schools? Are we going to look back in this and wring our hands and say, oh my God, wasn't this terrible? How could we have done this? So what we clearly need is more long-term thinking um, in our short-term world. And I think what, what Anne-Marie and Nora um, have elaborated on that very clearly. So I'm going to hand over back to Anne-Marie at this stage for the next session on um, national testimonies. OK, uh, thank you very much, Chris. That's That was very informative, what you said there, and, and very eye-opening as well. And also, um, we'll go on now to uh, this speakers and get the national who will give the national testimonies firstly maria joyce to follow will be bernard joyce and saoirse brady from the maria's from the national traveler williams forum thank you maria just invite you to unmute maria Sorry about that. I'm out of the country and I'm working with a very temperamental laptop. So apologies for any of that in, 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 in the context of this input. Um, but before I start, I just want to say the personal testimony shows by the women earlier shows the harsh reality of living without basic services such as clean water, sanitation, electricity, and also living in grossly substandard sites and the knock the knock-on impact that that has um, on their health, on their their health and well-being, and their children's. Um, I mean, no child should be going to school hungry, not because there isn't food, but because of the toxic toxic smells that is coming from the place that they live and the place that they call home, because it's right beside a, a, a recycling dump. Um, traveller children and women should not have to keep exposing their very lives in the pursuit of what is safe, appropriate, safe and appropriate accommodation, and which is a basic human right. Um, thanks Galway Travel Movement for the invitation to speak here today in what is a very important campaign in relation to um, speak a little about the national context and about the impact 
of poor accommodation on women and children. And that is what I'll attempt to do over the next few minutes. First, it's important to state that I am sure, and I'm sure others will do, we are in the context of a wider housing crisis, a traveler accommodation crisis and a COVID-19 pandemic. Because of that homelessness across all communities is a growing issue. The 2019 Department of Housing, Housing's own annual count um, found that one in 10 travelers, over one in 10 travelers are effectively homeless. In reality, these statistics obscure the reality of homelessness and accommodation conditions within the traveler community. The long-term lack of accommodation provision has pushed many travelers into sharing accommodation and overcrowding and, in unauthor and unauthorized sites. These families are not reflected in the government statistics on homelessness, and we know that the situation is, de is deteriorating. 504 travellers were in emergency accommodation in the Dublin area in 2019, and 23% of homeless families in Kerry um, were traveller families. These figures are from the Dublin and Kerry traveller accommodation programmes. And we also know there is a huge concern about the homelessness in traveller families living in Galway City. We know it is one of the highest in the country. Everybody here is very familiar with the national policy, legislation and infrastructure that has been put in place to support the safe and appropriate accommodation of travellers. That structure and scaffolding has not worked to a sufficient level to fulfil its purpose. To add to this, the system is not respons responsive enough when meeting problems and roadblocks, and there is no accountability for any of that. It's frustrating for us as community reps working on accommodation and housing issues, but it's downright dangerous for travellers who have to live in unsafe and unsanitary conditions. This is happening in the context of continuous underspends of national traveller accommodation budgets by local authorities. And we know most, most of the blocks and barriers in relation to the lack of new bills of traveller specific accommodation is at local level and lo in, in terms of local authorities. I cannot begin to describe how infuriating it is to witness councillors hand wringing about housing issues and homelessness on one hand, and then hear that they have vetoed or voted against a site proposed for a traveller group housing or a site um, on the other. The part eight planning process has got to be dealt with in our or our current crisis will deepen. Councillors must step up to the mark in relation to the local authorities primary role in the provision of housing and accommodation. The ongoing COVID-19 pandemic has had a disproportionate impact on travellers, as well as having a particular impact on traveller women and girls. Issues that traveller women face in terms of housing and homelessness have been greatly exacerbated, especially for those most, most vulnerable in the community. In response to the situation, the Traveller Accommodation Unit in the Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage issued guidance on mitigating measures to ensure safety of traveller families. They also simplified the funding process. Of course, there were still issues in the rollout of COVID-19 measures at local level in some local authorities. In these instance, instances, funding and guidance, guidance was not a barrier at national level. I don't want to overstate the positives in local authorities' responses to COVID-19. They were very important basic measures, but in most cases didn't deal with the issues of overcrowding, which we've heard about this morning in relation to the impact that that has had on travellers not being able to safely self-isolate um, in, 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 in overcrowded conditions. The reason I'm highlighting it is because it did demonstrate that the system can be responsive, can re be responsive and collaborative, and we need to see more of this on a wider scale to address the, 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 the bigger issues. The implementation of all 32 recommendations covering delivery, reflecting need, planning, capacity and resources, including governance, in the expert review of the 1998 Housing Traveller Accommodation Act in full is crucial to ensure adequate supply and a high standard of culturally appropriate accommodation for travellers. Clear timelines, a budget for implementation and tangible targets with corresponding monitoring and accountability measures 
along with strong proper engagements at all levels will be essential for the delivery of, of, of the recommendations. Full, implement, full implementation must include repeal of the trespass legislation and putting in place the legislative, pro legislative provisions to suspend the reserved function of elected members for approval of part eight proposals for traveller accommodation, and also to suspend the reserve function relating to the agreement to dispose of land for the purposes of developing traveller accommodation and provide these as executive fun functions. Good policy is not enough. We need delivery and implementation to make a difference on the lived lives of travellers and to have an impact across all areas in terms of health, education and so on, and including the employment. Housing has a particular effect on women as they spend more time in the home and are the primary carers. So they bear the brunt of having to cope with basic conditions such as lack of clean, lack of clean water, lack of adequate refuse collection, poor sanitation and unsafe areas for children to play, as has already been highlighted. There are also huge shortcomings in the provision for traveller women experience and violence against women. Refuges provided in Ireland, which doesn't meet um, the Istanbul Convention standards of one family place per 10,000 population. It has also highlighted the lack of gender analysis, analysis of homelessness, which means women and children fleeing domestic violence are not categorised as homeless, nor are they integrated into strategies dealing with housing and homelessness. This has meant that refugees struggle to access resources and referral pathways for women when it comes to accessing safe and secure accommodation and housing. Women and children being accommodated in emergency refuge accommodation must be represented in homeless statistics. And additional funding is needed to ensure women living in violent situations are fast tracked to access, access secure and affordable long-term housing options. As one of the key determinants of health, accommodation has also contributed to traveller children being 3.6 times more vulnerable to not survive in the first year of their life and to 50% not expected to live beyond the age of 40. The most recent report by the Children's Ombudsman, Ombudsman's Office, No End in Sight, presents a very chilling insight into the lives of children living on a site where there has been 30 years of failure by a local authority. One 12 year old girl is quote, it's like an, an abandoned place that people forgot about. It's like we're forgotten. We feel like we're garbage. No, sh no child should have to feel like that and no child should feel abandoned. And when they do, we must respond. The frightening reality is that these conditions are mirrored in every county across this country, including here in Galway. Government must commit, must commit to including clear actions, targets, indicators, outcomes, timeframes, and adequate resources in the National Traveller and Roma Inclusion Strategy, in the National Strategy for Women and Girls, and in the Programme Board, which has the responsibility to, to deliver on the recommendations of the re expert review that I've spoken about earlier to address the accommodation and homeless crisis experienced by travellers, traveller women and girls. There has to be accountability and it has to be underpinned by sanctions and dilution of powers if local authorities continue to fail in their key function in implementing not just national traveller accommodation policy but recommendation, recommendations in their own local accommodation programs. And I'll leave it there because I don't want to take up too much time in this part of the segment, but, um, 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 but I, I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay. Thank you, Maria, for that. Um, that was very, very informative and very, very sad to hear your findings there. And we'll just move on now at this point to Bernard Joyce from the Irish Traveller Movement, and he will also give a national testimony. Marie, thank you so much for the invitation to um, today. Um, I'm going to give you a presentation. I'll try not to cover what others have already said, but maybe just to highlight that. Um, you know, the testimonies that was given really shine a further light in terms of the living experience of travellers across the country. Um, 
and that is a real reality um, in terms of now, but also in terms of showcasing, I suppose, the inadequate provision of accommodation across the country. So it's, you know, um, it was really disturbing and, and hard to watch on a personal level and as a traveller. Um, and, you know, it is an indictment um, by the state in terms of the systematic failures. Um, so what I will do is I will go into a presentation that we put together in terms of the Irish Shopping Movement and cover off some key, key areas. So human rights viol violations highlighted today are mirrored right across the country despite legislation framework. Um, so I just want to bring your attention to the fact that 39% of the problems nationally live in very much overcrowded accommodation, 24% live in severe housing dep deprivation, and 5% live without piped water or sewage supplies. And these figures are from the SRI and the Human Rights Equality Commission um, report um, 2021. In some local authority areas, for example, Galway, um, which we're focusing in on, um, it is already stated that 50 percent of 50 percent of the homeless families, um, while accounting for just just over one percent of the population, um, is situated caused by and made worse by overlines on the HAP and discrimination in the private rental sector. The unambitious or no targets. That are, are constantly set for tra tra Pacific accommodation and TAPS. Again, 20 families living in Galway City are waiting for a tra Pacific accommodation, are very much in limbo. Um, and you know, in terms of nationally, just seven group housing were built or refurbished in 2019. So it's extremely um, you know, below what is it, you know, it's making the situation even worse. Um, when you look at the budget, 72 million euros has gone unspent from 2008 to 2019. And one of the primary causes of the current traveller accommodation crisis and the budgets has declined from 40 million in 2008 to 15.5 million um, today. So when you look at, I was asked to kind of just focus a little bit on the Travel Homes Matter campaign. And I suppose this, this part of it brings into that. So when you look at the figures that the, um, the accommodation crisis that we're in um, goes back for decades. And, um, and in fact, when the testimonies were given, it kind of, it reminded me of the living conditions um, within Dublin. And it is absolutely just shocking and appalling that over that period of time that those changes really haven't um, been made on, on, on the ground. So, I suppose what is it you know what is it that we want to do and this, and, and 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 you know when we talk about you know campaigns really we're talking about a home for travelers so within our approach here um in terms of the travel homes campaign nationally um i suppose we wanted to i suppose renew a direct action campaign that was led by the travelers um within given national visibility. Um, it was to present clear evidence. It was to build solidarity. It was to um, target the, those who were in decisions in terms of making those changes and demanding human rights because um, it is a human rights issue and no other, no other society would be expected to live in those conditions. And for our community, it was to make it real for our community. And our message was the trappers need a home like everybody else. So what did, what did we ask for? So we asked for the establishment of a national traveler accommodation agency. Now you might ask, um, you know, how, how did that come? And in fact, that was one of the, uh, that was one of the first um, asked in the 1995 uh, um, task force report, in fact, under accommodation. Um, and here we are still asking for the National Accommodation Agency. We called for an amendment to Part 8 um, planning. Um, I just need to go back there, sorry about that. Um, we called for the amendment of the Part 8 planning. Um, and um, 
Just give me a second, I just need to go back. And making housing a constitutional right. We also wanted to repeal the criminal trespass legislation and make temporary provision for families a priority. So that, that actually meant that there should be no families across this country, no women, no children, um, without adequate provision of emergency accommodation to meet their needs. Um, so you might ask, just in terms of nationally, the accommodation crisis obviously has been highlighted by um, across many platforms. So it's not just holds here saying this today. So you have the United Nations Universal Periodic Review, United Nations Convention on the Right of the Child, um, the U UN on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, the Collective Complaint to the Council of Europe, um, and the Council of Europe Commission Against Racism and Tolerance. So you have all these bodies um, that are saying that Ireland is not doing enough in terms of provision of accommodation. At a national level, you have the Joint Committee on Issues Affecting tra the Travel Community, the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission, the Ombudsman for Children's Office, Joint Committee on Housing, the Travel Rockers Group, who took a specific systematic focus, and the current last style, um, you can see the Office of Planning and Regulation. So there have been significant um, you know, calls in terms of elite addressing the accommodation needs of the traveller community um, in, in a culturally appropriate way. So the outcome of the campaign um, has been um, that there has been a um, traveller accommodation um, review. Um, the review was carried out and that the key successes of the campaign was the traveller accommodation expert review commissioned by the government published in 2019. So it found that local authorities failed to meet the full scale of traveller accommodation needs. It highlighted uneven delivery across local authorities and that the review of 32 recommendations provided a roadmap to real progress across four teams. One, governance, two, resourcing, three, delivery, reflecting the needs and planning. Um, so reflecting the ask of traveller homes matter campaign at the time. So we felt that that was obviously successful in being able to inform or shape the, the review that was carried out. Currently, um, the progress on the implementation of the recommendations. So the programme board to date, in which um, there, um, the, myself, Bridget Kelly, are members of, along with the CCM, um, the, um, the minister and the officials. Um, and to date, there's been five meetings. Um, and while 18 recommendations were planned to be completed in 21, just two of the 32 recommendations have been implemented in full. Um, so you can see there, just a diagram on the left. So what's needed is, what we have been calling for is that there's a need for the sub subgroups to facilitate dialogue consultation with key stakeholders, that there needs to be clear timelines to ensure accountability and transparency and a clear budgets to ensure full resourcing for the delivery of, for delivery of this, um, of the, um, the accommodation. And there has to be a um, political will to deliver um, if it's to be fully implemented. The key, key asks in terms of the implementation of all 32 recommendations include the priori prioritization. And again, this has been mentioned here, um, but you know the uh, the establishment of a national traveller accommodation agency authority to independently monitor, oversee the planning and delivery of traveller specific accommodation, the gaps in planning for traveller specific accommodation, and the we recognise the, the there's obviously poor information gathering and lack of plan for future needs evident in the current traveller accommodation program, as reported by the Irish Travel Movement and the Irish Human Rights and Equality in the recent review. The quality review. So we feel that even with the targets that are set, set, some of those targets are extremely poor and are not ambitious enough in terms of delivery of um, meeting the current needs and, um, and therefore not even 
meeting the projected needs as we go forward. The repeal of the, the criminal trespass legislation, I know just mentioned earlier, just in, in terms of the evictions, but we want to see the end, the end, the end of criminalization of nomadism in this country. It's deep trauma of evictions and that to remedy Ireland's breach of Article 16 of the European Social Charter in relation to eviction procedures. And that we, we also need to see to circumvent the part of the planning process to remove a key barrier to delivery caused by racism and discrimination lo locally. So if there's any questions after, I, I, we'll, we'll take it um, as part of, of, of a broader discussion. So again, thank you very much. Okay, thank, um, thank you very much, Bernard. Uh, that was a very, very informative also and really brought to light the stark reality for travellers living in Ireland. And we'll move on now to our next speaker, Sorsha Brady, and she's from the Children's Rights Alliance. Thanks, Samari. Um, and just to say thanks to Go A Traveller Movement for inviting us along today to talk about these really important issues. Um, I'm still reeling from the, the testimonies from the families themselves and particularly um, Mikey, the young person who I think was so succinct um, in summing up that this just can't continue to happen, that, that things need to change. And I suppose a lot has been talked about already about, you know, what has happened. And, you know, I have a list of reports here that I could rhyme off. I think a number of people have done already. These issues are well documented. We know what children's rights, what, what, what the children's rights, um, the UN Convention Rights of Children say. And at the Children's Rights Alliance, that's what we subscribe to. We look at the UN Convention, the rights of the child, and we want it to be fully implemented in Ireland. Um, but we fully recognise that sometimes there are barriers and challenges to do that. And I think one of the things that's often thrown back at us is the lack of resources. Yet when it comes to traveller children, I think it's really clear from, you know, the, the IREC equality audit that you've mentioned. Um, you know, Bernard talked about the 72 million being handed back by local authorities. The money is there, but the political will to change things isn't. I think that's what's clear. And, um, you know, when we talk about children's rights, every child has a right to be free from discrimination, to grow up, uh, you know, in an equal world. They should be equal with their peers. But that's not what's happening for traveller children in Ireland. Um, children have the right to life, survival and development. Um, you know, traveller children have a right to their identity. They have a right to their cultural identity and that should be recognized you know the right to add to an adequate standard of living it you know that encompasses the right to a home the right to a house and it's not just about having a roof over your head or four walls it's about having a home somewhere that you can live in dignity and with respect and you know um Leah the, the little girl in the video is about a similar age to my own little boy and just hearing about her mum talk about you know all the gastroenteritis and just having to deal with that I can't imagine dealing with that without running water never mind a washing machine you know having to deal with those everyday experiences um they should you know those are things that we really need to look at and address and I think those testimonies hearing from people directly is one of the most powerful tools that the Galway Traveller movement are bringing to the fore here um certainly um in the Children's Rights Alliance one of the things that we do our flagship publication every year is we produce a report card where we look at what the government has committed to do for children and young people. We've done this since 2009 and since 2013 we have tracked the progress on traveller children. So those commitments change depending on the government because we look to the programme for government. We try and hold the government accountable to what they said they'd do. So sometimes in previous programmes for government it's been around accommodation for, for children and young people um, of, from the travelling community. Um, sometimes it's around implementing the national um, integration strategy. Uh, at the moment, it, the commitment in the programme for government is around education for traveller children. But what's really striking is I look back at all the grades over the years, the highest grade that the government has ever gotten in our report card when it comes to the rights of traveller and Roma young people um, and children is a D plus. And that was the year the traveller ethnicity was recognised. Um, They've gotten four Ds over the years and they've gotten five Es. So 
a D when we when we grade this, basically this is a we get a panel, an independent panel that's chaired by former Supreme Court Justice uh, Mrs. Catherine McGuinness. And it, it's an independent panel that comprises um, representatives from unions, from business, from academia, um, and, and it is a truly independent panel. But they look at what the government has, has decided or has done and what progress they've made, and they grade them based on their actions every year. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a real indictment when, when it, the grades that they're getting are Ds and Es. And a D means, um, a, oh, well, let me just get the actual wording here. It's a barely acceptable performance with little or no action. While an E means it's unacceptable taking steps in the wrong direction and has no positive impact on children. So I think that speaks volumes for the progress that has been made when it comes to um, traveler children and young people. Um, earlier this year, and I know a number of the other speakers, including uh, Maria and Bernard, have alluded to the report published by the Ombudsman for Children, No End in Sight. Now, that was about a, a halting site in Cork, um, and it dealt with 66 children and young people. But I think it's indicative of what's happening all around the country when it comes to halting sites and um, roadside accommodation. These conditions are unspeakable, but they're deplorable and they're completely unacceptable. Now, in terms of the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child, back in 2016, they recognised the structural discrimination that children um, and traveller children and young people face in Ireland when it comes to accommodation, when it comes to education, when it comes to healthcare and various other rights that are being impacted um, by, by the government's inaction uh, to address them. So I suppose really we have an opportunity next year because the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child will be examining Ireland once again in 2022, in September 2022. The Children's Rights Alliance we will be putting together a parallel report. So we will be seeking inputs from our members um, as to what the strategic issues are that we should focus on. But given the focus that there has always been on traveller children and young people, I imagine that will be one of the priority issues that comes up again next year. Um, I would, you know, I also want to focus on some of the other opportunities that are coming up. Um, I know that GTM are going to talk about solutions at the end, but maybe these are some things that could inform them as well. The Department of Children, Equality, uh, Disability, Integration and Youth, they have responsibility for the national policy framework for children and young people. So while the previous framework that ran from 2014 to 2020 did recognise some of the uh, challenges and barriers that are faced by traveller children and young people, not all of the commitments that were made to them were implemented. And our understanding is that next year they are going to produce a new national policy framework and they're going to use the recommendations that come from the UN committee to try and formulate some of the um, commitments, objectives and actions that will be taken. So I think that's a real opportunity for us to try and shape some of, some of the actions that come there. Um, Marie also mentioned uh, NITRIS and the National Women and Girls Strategy. So that, there will be an evaluation of those strategies um, coming up next year and they will be redeveloped. And Minister O'Gorman, I, I, I've met with him in a different form and you know he is very open to looking at whether or not there should be um, cross-cutting commitments across the different strategies. And I would say there should be, given you know, that many of these issues face young uh, traveller girls and, and women. But I suppose one of the things that I would stress is, you know, when it comes to children's rights, two of the most important rights are making decisions in the best interest of children. And one of the ways or one of the things that you need to incorporate them when you're doing that is hearing from the voice of children and young people themselves. And I think traveller children and young people have a very different experience to those of some other settled um children and young people, or even those from different ethnic minorities. So I think that that is something that needs to be stressed and that that needs to happen when evaluating those um, equality strategies. There's also an ongoing review of equality legislation. So I think that's another opportunity to, to highlight what is working and what isn't when it comes to traveler um, children and young people. Um, but I think, you know, overall, there, there are, Traveller children are overrepresented when it comes to poverty statistics, when it comes to homelessness statistics. You know, tra the traveller population makes up 1% of the, 
of, of the Irish population, yet they're overrepresented in all of these areas. And that needs to be addressed and, and real action needs to be taken. So we need to find creative ways to do that. We don't just need more reports. I think we have the evidence. It's now, now is the time to really find how we can actually push further, how we can get real meaningful action on the commitments that have been made or the commitments that will be made. Um, and you know, one of the other things I just want to want to flag with you is that the EU has recently published um, a strategy on the rights of the child. And as part of that, they've put in place an EU child guarantee. And Ireland has to develop a national child poverty action plan by March next year, and they'll publish it in June. And they have to provide the European Commission with that. Now, the target group for that is children in need. And children in need also um, incorporates uh, children from ethnic minorities. So I think that's another opportunity to really ensure that traveler children and their, their rights and needs are addressed. You know, accommodation is one thing, but it has such a, a trickle down impact on the lives of children and young people. We have done, um, we've done research on the educational impact of homelessness on, on children uh, generally. But what we know is children don't thrive when they're when they're going to school hungry, when they're going to school with little sleep, when they're cold, when they're sick. And um, this has such a detrimental impact on, on their social development. And that's something that we really need to see um, addressed by government. Um, and it's something that we'll be looking at again in this year's report card. So in the Children's Rights Alliance, you know, we fully support the recommendations of this inquiry. Um, we, we fully support what's been said already. And we really welcome it because I think it does really shine a spotlight on the reality of lives for children and young people who are living on halting sites or by the roadside. And I think if, you know, if, I, th I think the settled com community do know a lot of this, but I think those powerful voices and hearing directly from the people involved that that's where we can maybe try and make inroads in some of the, the attitudes um, that have gone on. And hopefully today, you know, we can hear about some of the solutions and see how we can all move forward to progress this. So thanks again for the invitation. Okay, Emery, will I will I check on here? I think this is um just thanks to all of the speakers. We were due to have an next section, which was going to be on government responses, um, but I think various efforts were made to get a government response from various sources. But um, uh, as we understand it at this point, none was forthcoming. Um, just before we move on to the international speakers, one of the few things or a few things that that strike me from those um sessions um from Maria Bernard and from Sirsha. Um, so clearly there's a system design problem. This is a term that's probably a much abused term. The system is wrong. It's all the system design. But it's clearly um, the system for designing and delivering travel accommodation um, isn't working um, and it's broken and it needs to be fixed. Um, getting a D and an E grade, I like that because this is my world giving out. I know I rarely give out D and E grade. You'd want to be really, really fairly bad to get a D or an E grade. Um, but um, obviously in this case, um, that's been provided. I am mindful um, sometimes that, you know, when these types of sessions take place, if there are officials here, um, you know, this needs to be seen not as people's opinion. Um, this isn't just opinion. Uh, it's not an attack on officials. It's not an attack on local government. This is sharing of evidence. Um, and you know, the whole world of policymaking now is about evidence based or evidence informed policymaking. Um, and this is evidence. Um, it needs to be seen as such and not just taken as some kind of a blanket criticism that's met with hurt or defensiveness or denial. Um, it needs to be met with a recognition of valid validity or a recognition of, I really have to do better. Now, I'm a public sector worker. Um, and I know sometimes, oh, if a student criticizes the way I'm teaching or I'm doing something, oh, my first reaction may be, oh my God, well, what would they know? Oh, do they not realize how busy I am? Oh, do they not realize how difficult a job this is? But then my second reaction has to follow on quickly is maybe they're right. I have to listen to it and I have to see are there ways that I can do that I can do better and that I can respond. Um, I'm struck by the comments that were made in a number of the talks around accountability um, and accounts accountability means answerability. Um, and for accountability to be meaningful, 
there has to be consequences. Which of us in our personal or our professional or whatever lives um, don't understand what accountability means? If it doesn't get measured, it doesn't matter, is a phrase that's often used. Um, if there isn't the consequence for not doing something, you know, if, if I didn't put on six kilos by sitting eating ice cream for the next year, well, then I'd be sitting eating ice cream for the next year. There is a consequence that makes me stop doing it. So accountability um, requires consequences. But too often, I suppose, we're hearing in the presentations that there are no consequences. Um, what are the consequences that just don't seem to be and they don't seem to be there? Um, so a, a number of suggestions were made, but I'm struck by the, the, the very last point around making decisions in the best interest of children and requiring people though, to listen to children and to listen to the voices so they can define what is in their own best self-interest. With that, we need to take off, um, and I think certain people in particular need to take off the lenses that we've all grown up with, the lenses that we've been socialized into believing and put on a social justice lens or else at least look through the world, look at the world through the lens that somebody else can describe their own reality in, and then take action on that, not assume that we know what's in everybody else's best interest. Okay, so with that, I'm going to hand back over to Anne-Marie, who is um, going to introduce um, our two international speakers. Okay, thank you very much, Chris. And it's, you know, it was good for to have you uh, after each uh, section making comments and highlighting the issues and, and drawing out the problems. And it's an important part of this inquiry today also. And we'll now move on to our two international speakers. And I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Fer Ferdinand Deverine, and I hope I'm pronouncing the name properly, and apologies if not. Uh, and Dr. Deverine, in, since 2017, he's the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Minority Issues as part of the, his mandate. And he's the reference point on the protection of the human rights of national or ethnic, religious and linguistic minorities. He is also extraordinary professor of the Faculty of Law at the University of Pretoria in South Africa and the adjunct professor at the National University of Ireland in Galway. And he is Chung Yong Tong visiting professor, hope that's pronounced properly, at the Faculty of Law of the University of Hong Kong in China. And he is uh, renowned as one of the world's leading experts in the international human rights of min minorities. He completed his law degree in Canada, his LLB in Montanan, I think, and the United Kingdom LLM in London, the School of Economics and Political Science, and the Netherlands, the do uh, Doctorate in Law at Maastricht. Dr. Deverine research and publications record spans over 200 pu publications in more than 30 languages in recognition of his work and achievements in the field of human rights and the protection of minorities. He has received accolades from Africa, Asia and Europe, including the 2021 prize of the Federalist Union of European Nationalities in 2004, yeah, he got the Lingua Pax Award from Barcelona and the, uh, the Knight's Cross of the Order of Merit from the Republic of Poland and the Tip O'Neill Peace Fellowship from Northern Ireland. So, Dr. Deverine, we're very, very honoured to have you speaking here at our inquiry today. And uh, without further ado, I'll let you speak. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Anne-Marie. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, mesdames et messieurs, bonjour. So first of all, I'm honored and delighted to be part of the launch of the comprehensive Traveler Homes Now Monitoring Port. Um, please allow me to thank, to thank you, to thank the organizers, Galway Traveler Movement, National Travelers Women's Forum, and Travelers Homes Now Campaign Team for inviting me to join your event and also allow me to congratulate you, to con congratulate all of you for the efforts to address what we've heard are really unacceptable conditions under which travelers are still allowed to live and which would normally not continue, I have to say, were they not a minority, still the subject of prejudices and bias in Ireland. Um, I wanted to commend you also, all of you who have been involved in this campaign. And I especially wanted to focus 
on one dimension of this campaign, which has come out on, on a few occasions, but I, I have to insist that in my opinion, it not only, it is important to focus on this because the campaign is not only about mapping the progress of the of traveler homes now from 2017 and 2021, it presents the work to date using a human rights framework. And I have been very impressed by many of the suggestions that were made earlier for concrete steps. And I emphasize the implementation here has to occur. Concrete steps that can and must be done to deal in practice with the, the needed also legal and policy changes to deal with what is, as we've heard, really unacceptable and in fact, brutally unfair and unjust continuing housing conditions for many travelers in Ireland. And even I would add, and I think it has been mentioned earlier, the criminaliz criminalization of nomadism. All of this allows me to highlight one significant aspect of your campaign and the progress made, but also where much more is needed by reference to human rights. I'll go back uh, to that in just a moment, but if you allow me in the meantime, uh, please, I'd like to mention very quickly as some of you have, have intimated also, that as members of an ethnic mi mi minority, at least that's sort certainly clearly acknowledged with the United Nations human rights system, you do have human rights that are specific to your needs. This means amongst others that your, the rights of Roma and travelers are entitled to enjoy, include the right to enjoy their own culture with other members of their community and this can also involve elements of their uh, traditional way of life. I've noted that the uh, travely, traveler uh, family tenants of Galway City and Galway City uh, count, uh, County Councils are continuing to experience extremely poor, unsafe, and unhealthy accommodation conditions. And one of the points I, I would like to share with you um, and bring perhaps to your attention and where we've already heard very powerful uh, testimonies earlier, is that what is involved is, are not just human rights connected to habitable or housing and accommodation, but also human rights that in most cases involve probable issues of discriminatory treatment. And I want to treat, to deal with the, the concept or of equality and the prohibition of discrimination um, separately, we're in addition to, we're a complement to the uh, situation of, the, of housing. What I've heard and read suggests to me that there are differences of treatment here of individuals belonging to minorities, the travelers, who are living in conditions which would not be acceptable for others. And these kind of conditions that we've been hearing today should really ring alarm bells that there could be, or in my opinion, there are clearly situations of discriminatory treatment in how some of the policies are interpreted and implemented in Ireland. And this, just to make the point very clearly, involves violations, breaches of one of the most fundamental of human rights, the prohibition of discrimination. So the treatment here, I would go so far as to say, would not exist if they occurred to others from the majority population in Ireland. And it is that the, therefore, that the traveler minority is involved, uh, that the, it's because we are dealing with a minority, and a minority which is often a target of certain prejudices that are still there, that their conditions are allowed to persist over many years, too many years, quite, quite frankly. And I wanted to mention there, therefore, specifically the prohibition of discrimination. It's one of the main pillars of uh, human rights and international law, really, because it's not exactly the same as the prohibition of discrimination in the European human rights system. I, I, I have to emphasize this, and there's a connection to uh, the housing uh, situation that you're experiencing. 
in international law, the United Nations, we have provisions like Article 26 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which, which is a general prohibition of discrimination. And it can, it can apply, it does apply to any kind, any policy, any practice, any legislation, even to a country's constitution, by the way. In Europe, you don't have the same degree of protection, unfortunately, under the European Convention, Convention for Human Rights, because the more or less equivalent provision, Article 14 of the Convention, act, is actually restricted and cannot be applied to areas such as housing, as a matter of fact. And I mention this because in Europe, you have an infamous, what I would call in fact, infamous decision involving uh, travelers in Roma in the United Kingdom, the case of Chapman versus the UK. And it's infamous because there the European courts um, essentially uh, was dealing with a case where there was a refusal for permission for uh, travelers to live in a caravan on lands they actually owned. Now, many of you will know that this case, will, will know this case much better than I will, I'm sure. But uh, to summarize very quickly, the European court, first of all, and it, this sounded positive, the European court recognized that Roma and travelers had different housing and other needs. But then it actually started to nuance that point. It actually described the needs of the uh, travelers in Roma in the UK as special which I find objectionable because it actually suggests that the Romas and travelers, they have, because of their different uh, lifestyle and culture, their uh, needs are somewhat separate or how would I say, not normal as those needs of the majority in the United Kingdom. That really is what the court is saying here. And that to me is absolutely objectionable. It is not because you have certain traditions or lifestyle of the majority that that becomes the norm and all of the others are exceptions or special or somehow not as acceptable or um, usual as those of the majority. Now, on the one hand, a lot of um, observers, what has been referred to by some of you as quote unquote experts, um, in Europe thought that there was still a great victory because the court did talk about uh, the Roma uh, travelers as being a minority uh, who's, who did have rights. In my opinion, it, this is not true because at the end of the day, the European court did not recognize, did not agree to actually implement the rights of minorities. What the court did was to take from Peter to pay Paul by admitting that while the, uh, the authorities, the British authorities refusal to grant permission for a caravan, um, why that, while that was an interference with, the, with human rights, with the enjoyment of a home, as well as with private and family life connected to the issue of a traditional way of life for Roma and travelers. The court then went on to, uh, the, to describe the interference as and here, quote unquote, necessary in a democratic society, end of quote, because the land inhabited by the Roma family was a subject of environmental protection and that really the UK had a great deal of discretion on how to deal with this kind of an issue. And here, the human rights of the traveler in Roma were not as important, so important. Really, the British officials knew best how to deal with such matters and essentially, the court used uh, a, what is called a, a margin of appreciation, a discretion to say that it was for the British to decide uh, this matter and that the court would actually not apply the human rights obligations for the Roman travelers in the UK that uh, should have been uh, argued fully. Now, it, you can give this decision a positive spin and many have not, have, but I do not. In the United Nations system, the result would have been, would, would not have been the same because we do not recognize that states, that government officials have discretion, what the court calls a margin of appreciation when deciding whether, uh, whether some human rights can be ignored. Human rights can never be ignored. 
However, that's what the court did in relation to travelers and Roma in the Chapman case. There was also no conclusion by the court that the Roma might have been treated in a discriminatory way because the European Convention of Human Rights does not have a general provision to prohibit discrimination. It only does for a limited number of rights and housing is not one of them. In the United Nations human rights system, housing issues can be dealt with through the lens of the general prohibition of non-discrimination. And I would suggest this might open the door to additional approaches, but also mechanisms you might consider using in the Traveler Homes Now campaign. And this includes raising matters of delays or unaddressed poor, unsafe, or unhealthy housing conditions using, once again, mainly the prohibition of discrimination. And we, we've heard some of them, but we not only have four United Nations committees, which would be interested in these matters, they are the, UN, the UN Human Rights Committee, the Committee on Racial Discrimination, the Committee on the Rights of the, of the Child, which we've heard earlier, and the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. In addition to those four treaty legal document mechanisms, there are a number of special procedure mechanisms as the United Nations would also be uh, have mandates where uh, these issues could be raised. Um, in, in addition to myself as special rapporteur on minority issues, there is of course a special rapporteur on housing. So as a matter of fact, this is perhaps I think the appropriate moment to mention that uh, traveler and Roma issues have been of considerable importance at the office of the United Nations High Commissioner from Human Rights uh, at, since at least 2014, uh, when the UN Human Rights Council recognized that Roma in Europe, and this would include travelers, have face, faced for, for four or five centuries, as a matter of fact, widespread and, and enduring discrimination, rejection, social exclusion, and marginalization. In, in all areas of life, really. What it also said at the UN uh, when the Human Rights Council adopted this resolution is that it still there still exists for Roma and travelers. Yeah, there still continues to be social and economic marginalization and bias and prejudices that affects their full participation in society, but also that anti-Roma and anti-traveler sentiment continues to exist as you all well know, and that this is a major obstacle to the successful, successful social inclusion of travelers and Roma and the full respect of their human rights. Um, these, I would say, are some of the reasons why the UN Human Rights Office in Geneva has a special advisory group for Roma. And once again, this would include, at least for the purposes of the UN travelers and that this uh, special advisory group uh, works with officials at the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights to strengthen the uh, effective exercise of human rights by Roma and travelers. It does this through supporting um, work to develop government policies. We do actually sometimes uh, work with governments uh, closely. Uh, so to develop government policies on Roma inclusion, inclusion strengthening the capacities of Roma and in particular Romani women. And I, once again, I emphasize that we also include travelers here to take part in local, regional, national and international decision-making as well as by working to challenge or to change patterns and practices of discrimination and abuse. And I have to emphasize this point that the difficulties and challenges that need to be addressed through the human rights framework are still many. They haven't disappeared. In some areas, progress is made, but particularly in the area of housing, uh, as we've seen also during this period of pandemic, things have often not truly uh, improved. There has been in parts of Europe growing anti-Roma uh, hate speech, where Roma are being blamed falsely, of course, for spreading COVID. And also of great concern has been that COVID health and related restrictions have triggered, well, in a sense, a perfect storm of exclusion for Roma across Europe, and that the conditions, the living conditions of many Roma and travelers 
has actually not been fully considered and taken into board onto on, on board when developing measures to address the pandemic. As the European Union director of the Fundamental Rights Agency, Michael O'Flaherty, who um, is well known to many of you, of course, in Galway and Ireland, um, he actually earlier this year uh, stated that the Roma, who are already shoved to the margins of society, have really been experiencing still further deprivation, discrimination, and harassment. And this is still much, and there's still much to be done in housing, obviously, and many other areas. And finally, I'd like to mention that we have at the United Nations that we have a special program that might be of interest to members of the travel community. And I mention this because um, uh, I think in a way you've been omitted. Human rights activists from countries around the world can spend a period of time, a number of months actually, at the United Nations in Geneva in what we call the a Minority Fellowship Program. And we have had a significant number of Roma over the years, but I don't think, in fact, I'm certain we've ever had any member of the traveler community from either Ireland or the UK. So perhaps this is something to explore a bit further in the future. And additional information can be obtained by contacting either me or my office in Geneva so that we can perhaps uh, uh, correct that deficiency. Many of you, the Galway Traveler Movement and the Traveler Homes Now campaign are working at changing the situation, the discrimination really against uh, Roma through your dedication and efforts. And I must congratulate you and hope that you'll, you will work closer together, including with the United Nations and other institutions by using this human rights framework with those of us within the United Nations, as well as the Council of Europe and the European, European Union, who are obviously strongly committed that no one should be left behind. And that as the preamble of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights pro proclaims, this means that Roma and travelers as members of the human family are entitled to inherent dignity and equal and inalienable human rights, including, and I would say especially, non-discrimination in housing. So again, my thanks to the Galway Traveler Movement and the Traveler Homes Now campaign team for the privilege of being able to address this event. And my only regret, and I do have one, is that I cannot be with you in person in Galway and the region which I know quite well. I have to also apologize. I will have to leave as I actually, I actually have some urgent matters that require my attention. I apologize also for that. Mesdames et Messieurs, merci beaucoup. Thanks. And I wish you continued success in your efforts and in your, in your deliberations today. Thank you. Okay. Okay, we'd like to thank uh, Dr. Bernie for his input and to say like it is very important that there's accountability when when looking at the, the breaches of human rights and the violation of human rights in terms of what the traveler accommodation and the way that it is in Ireland today for the traveler community. And it it is great to have someone like uh, Dr. Ferdinand speaking from the platform that he represents. And now we'd like to have our next international speaker. And just to introduce, introduce her, Lelani Farrow, she's the former UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Adequate Housing and the world's top watchdog on housing, and has set out to reignite the idea that housing is a special uh, is a social good, not an asset or commodity. Farah launched a new initiative called The Shift, a global movement which calls for everyone to approach housing as a human right, but not, um, as I said, but not as a commodity. Farah has represented reports to the UN on homelessness, the connection between housing and life itself, and the treatment of housing as a commodity and its consequences for people who are poor, as well as the middle class. She has traveled to India, Chile, Portugal, among other places to investigate whether governments are meeting their human rights obligations 
with respect to housing. And she is a lawyer by training and far as work in a, uh, to advance the rights of poor and marginalized groups throughout her career. So thank you very much Far, for coming uh, to be part of our inquiry and i let you go ahead now and speak. Thank you so much, Anne-Marie, excuse me. And thanks to the um, hosts of this event. I have to say, <coughs> excuse me, I feel incredibly uh, privileged to have been invited uh, to be with you today. Uh, I've been moved um, by every speaker and every testimony, moved in different ways. Um, obviously, it's really hard to listen to the residents, the travelers themselves and, and their experiences because um, it's worse than unacceptable. Um, and uh, so that's really hard. But for that reason, I feel really privileged. I learn so much just by listening. So, so thank you. I think all of the testimonies and presentations have exposed really starkly, actually, um, that travelers are experiencing a real deprivation of human rights and, and that that is the best way to define what is going on for travelers in Galway uh, and in Ireland. Um, it's not just obviously a denial of the right to housing. It is, of course, an acute denial of the right to housing, but it's also all of those intersecting rights. And it's, it's really actually quite phenomenal when you start listing them, which is what I did as people were speaking. I was just like checking off which human rights are at play here. And um, beyond uh, the rights of particular groups, so you're seeing a distinct impact on children, for example, uh, distinct in impact on women, young people, but Beyond that, we're also seeing rights deprivations in terms of obviously non-discrimination and equality. Um, housing and housing deprivation is often both um, a driver of inequality and a consequence. And I really could see that here. So entrenching that ha one's housing status, travelers' housing status, entrenching inequality, um, while also um, um, being the cause of inequality. We, we saw in so many different ways, the rights to physical and mental health being jeopardized. We saw the rights to a healthy environment. This is some, This was real news to me when people were describing like being placed on a landfill and the, the toxic, toxicity of that uh, environment and, and the, the polluted air. You know, the right to a healthy environment was just recognized by the UN Human Rights Council as a human right. It's a newly articulated human right. And this is so much at play here. I, I, I could hear that. Um, obviously, the rights to water and sanitation are at play um, uh, with people reporting that they didn't have um, adequate access and having to purchase their own water and they don't have enough money. And I mean, it's just a catastrophe. And then of course, all of this taken together, clear deprivations of the right to life, the cornerstone of all human rights, um, dignity and life. That's what human rights are about really. Um, and the statistics, the harrowing statistics on suicidality and actual suicides, um, uh, morbidity, mortality rates, um, obviously uh, triggering right, real right to life concerns. Um, I will say um, I was really struck by the similarities between the treatment of travelers uh, by governments, local and national, and the way in which <clears throat> homeless populations the world over are treated. I mean, there's a direct parallel. There are obvious parallels. Um, the most obvious, perhaps, are with respect to the conditions, um, the very, very poor housing conditions, um, obviously grossly inadequate. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, a lack of services. I mentioned already water and heat was another one that a lot of people reference. I can't, I come from a cold country. I know what it's like to be cold and how horrible it is. I can bear, I have a dog. I can barely stand, you know, to be cold for a few minutes walking my dog, let alone living in that cold. And I know the cold of Ireland, it's, it's penetrating, it's in the bones. Um, so obviously, um, there are parallels with people living in homelessness, um, the overcrowding that was talked about, the cultural inappropriateness of the housing. That's one of the least talked about aspects of the human right to housing, but is so 
obviously important. You can't have a life of dignity um, and and peace and security if you're not in culturally appropriate housing. That's often the case for homeless populations who tend to be um, uh, minority populations, ethnic, religious, um, and racial minority populations. The evictions and evictions into homelessness, um, the criminalization of travelers, um, obviously, um, the discrimination and access to housing. Um, these are all things that I see um, um, homeless populations suffering as well. And so there's, there's the reason I draw that parallel is because um, homelessness um, or virtual homelessness, which is, I think, what travelers are living in, a kind of virtual homelessness, even if they might have some kind of a structure around them. Homelessness is a prima facie violation of the right to housing. So there's no other way to look at it. It is simply a violation of the right to housing. And so there's some really rich arguments to be made there um, with governments. But I suppose the most stark parallel that I would draw that I see the world over and it's, it is, I think, maybe the worst, it's not for me to decide what's the worst aspect of this, this is for the travelers yourselves to, to determine, but for me as an outsider, um, it's the invisibility of a very visible population. It's the erasure of travelers' voices, experiences, and expertise. It's um, the erasure of your opinions, of your knowledge, of your evidence, as was said. Um, I think it's the greatest harm caused by decision makers. Um, I, I hear this over and over and over again. I just want to be treated like a human being. I want to seem like I exist to my government's. And I heard that through your traveler stories, you are not being listened to. Um, what makes it worse in some ways in your context is your campaign, your incredible campaign. You are incredibly organized. You have documented everything that needs to be documented. You have a very clear and articulate voice and recommended solutions, a plan. You have demands. And so when governments ignore you, erase you, or don't listen to you, to me, that seems purposeful. And that seems that it must be related to the overall discriminatory treatment of travelers. I don't know how else to understand governments not being responsive in light of all you've done, in light of all that you've put out there, in light of all that you have, have collected and organized around. So that is very, very disheartening. One of the things that's also struck me about um, your work uh, that's been repeated several times now is your you, you have embraced a human rights framework. And um, it's not just, I think, cool or good that you've done so. I think you've done so for very particular reasons. And I'm going to articulate them back to you. I hope this resonates. I didn't, I didn't hear from you exactly why you chose a human rights frame, except for the fact that obviously it resonates on some visceral level because you know as travelers that your rights are being violated. People always know, they may not know that you all know your human rights law, which is amazing. Like you're, you're way more expert than me, I have to say. You know your human rights law, um, but you also know on a visceral level when your rights are being violated. I, I, I find that wherever I go, people whose rights are violated always know. They don't say, oh, my human rights are violated often, and they don't say, you know, Article 11, one of the covenant, but they do say, surely I'm entitled to a life of dignity. Surely I'm entitled to be listened to. So obviously, I think the human rights frame resonates with you all on so many levels from both the, the legal um, um, and the jurisprudence right down to that visceral feeling. Um, I want to remind you that you have embraced what is a transformative framework. And 
I want to put back to you what I think the strengths of that framework are um, to underscore the work that you're doing. First of all, as it was noted by a couple of speakers, the rights frame changes how travelers must be viewed. So it changes travelers from being criminals or non-productive members of society or whatever, whatever, what other stereotypes and stigmatizing notions attach to travelers. It changes that and it says, no, under a human rights frame, travelers are human rights holders and must be treated as human rights holders. So when you're living, wherever you're living, you are a human rights holder. And I find that so important to underscore because it means that when governments act, they, it shall not be an act of charity or benevolence. It is simply governments doing what they are legally obliged to do, which is to uphold the rights of rights holders. And that gets to my second point about the transformative nature of a human rights framework, which is, and we, we, it was just talked about a little bit, I think Chris was talking about it as well, is this idea of accountability. What, uh, I mean, the human rights framework is only that actually, it is an accountability framework and it is very clear who is accountable to whom. Governments are accountable to rights holders. Governments are accountable to people, simple. They have signed and ratified international human rights law that codifies the right to housing, that enumerates the right to housing. They have made a legal commitment and they are accountable to the people. And the last thing I'll say about the transformative nature of the rights framework is something that we've all said already. And, and uh, uh, we had a little discussion before this event started, uh, the group of us, and you know, the idea of who is expert. Well, under a human rights framework, people are experts in their own lives. You travelers are experts in your lives. You know what is best for you. You have ideas. You know what would make your lives better and livable and a life of dignity, peace, and security. And, and under the human rights frame, there is a requirement that you be able to meaningfully participate in any decision that affects your life. And meaningful participation doesn't just mean, oh, you get a seat at the table. It doesn't mean you get interviewed here and there. It means that your opinions should be able to influence the outcomes of whatever process you're involved in. And that is very hard for governments to stomach, especially governments that may hold some discriminatory attitudes toward you. They, don't, they might not believe that you could possibly know what's best for you, and they might not want to shed their own power and give you power to affect the decisions that will affect, to, to, to uh, weigh in on the decisions that will, and, and help determine the decisions that will affect your lives. And, and that to me is the battleground, to be honest. That is, that is um, one of the most difficult things to overcome. And I see um, that you are in that position. I want to, um, just end on a note of hope. Um, I say end, this is going to take a, a little a couple of minutes, so I'm not going to just wrap up really quickly, but I do want to say this. Um, I have found this session in incredible. I learned so much. What I, what I didn't know before coming here is how the gains that you as a movement have already made. To me, when I look at what's happening here, you have in place everything that you need for your rights to, uh, to be realized. Will this happen overnight? Probably not. But you are so well positioned and poised. I mean, the list of reports that have been written and recommendations, some of them underwhelming, but some of them, you know, I, I can't remember who, who was speaking about the um, one of the um, the travel the expert review of traveler accommodation act that there were good recommendations there um, 
there there were you know the ombuds report there a number of reports with recommendations have been written at national level um, or at local level and so that that's a good start and then on top of that you have recognition as a minority group you have um yourself done these incredible monitoring reports i couldn't i i hope they were provided to me before the session i opened them up these are incredible reports you're already doing the monitoring that's necessary you are organized as a group both locally in galway and nationally um you have clear and attainable recommendations that you've put out there things that you're looking for a number of you um, um referenced them there it has even been money uh, set aside for traveler accommodation there were mixed reviews on what's happened <laughs> sometimes that money was given back I, I find that just remarkable in light of um, the international legal standard that a government spend the maximum of its available resources right so governments are supposed to take all the resources that are available to them hard like cash <laughs> money uh, but also you know buildings that could be repurposed and lots of other resources that are out there governments are supposed to avail themselves of all available resources they're not supposed to give back money um, or underspend um, uh, in an area that is a, a human right so so i mean there's money out there uh, and then if you look at the regional level um you know the european social charter um Im impugned the evictions that have happened to travelers um we heard about the Ch uh, Children's Rights Committee and upcoming committee review um, that will definitely weigh in on travelers and, and the experiences of children uh, travelers. Um, the, the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights has already weighed in on this. Um, the UN Committee responsible, as you know, for monitoring Ireland's um, compliance with the right to housing. And they've said that there needs to be social housing. Um, they said very interesting interestingly that there needs to be a human rights complaint mechanism at the local level so that travelers have a place to go and lodge their uh, complaints and their their um, systemic issues systemic barriers to the right to housing um, they've said that housing should be culturally appropriate so you have a series of recommendations from a number of reports that are all taken together could could really um, um, including your own reports that could really make a difference. So I'm, I'm suggesting to you that you're close, that you're really close to making change. And that I, you know, I don't have a sense, I, I'm not some wizard, I can't tell you how change will be made in your context or when it will be made. But I have traveled the world and I kind of know when the ingredients are there for a really um, good uh, recipe, you know, um, and I think that I think that you've got all those pieces there. I would urge you to be yourselves as creative as you can be. I I noticed, for example, there is a big push in Ireland, not just from you all, um, for a constitutional right to housing. I think that's super important. But don't get stymied or stuck there. Look for other legislative moments and opportunities where the right to housing or other rights that would um, th that are being denied travelers could be moved forward. Look for those opportunities. Um, um, the the previous speaker, uh, the special rapporteur, um, suggested using non discrimination as a legal frame for your arguments. And you know, I would definitely support that because, of course, non discrimination is a non controversial human right. Non discrimination and inequality. How it gets how it gets treated is another issue. In any event, I want to close here. I'm sorry, I've spoken way longer than I should have. Probably a couple of minutes, and I apologize. But I do want to say that you you are so close. Please. Keep up your efforts, find solidarity in organizations like my own, The Shift. Um, we would be happy to support you. I do think pressure from the outside world on governments in Ireland could have a meaningful um, uh, impact. And um, I'm here and now committing myself and my organization to helping you. Um, so, so just keep going and, and, and let's do this.
That's great, Lilani. Thank you so much for that. And that's a very positive way to um, to end with that offer of solidarity. And I think one thing that um, that people in Ireland know for many years is that global solidarity is a really powerful um, a really powerful tool. Now we're we're running a little bit over time. Um, we had scheduled a question and answer session at this point. Um, and we are reluctant to lose all of that, but we might have to have it a little bit shorter. So if you would bear with us, if we run maybe 10 minutes over time, um, if you wouldn't mind, um, I, I, I'm seeing some people are dropping off. So if there are um, really short, succinct, important questions or points that somebody wants to make, um, there have been a few questions put into the chat that I've been watching. Um, some of them have been answered already in the chat, which is great. Um, but if anybody has some quick questions um, or comments that you would like to make, um, we could have Lilani or some of our earlier speakers giving quick responses to them. So what we might do is if we do have some quick questions or comments, we might just take a few of them together. Um, alternatively, if you want to put them into the chat, we can we can do with that. So would anybody like to um, anybody like to kick off on this? As I said, for, for no more than 10 minutes. Hello, uh, my name is Jim O'Brien. I just want to make a, a sort of a comment on, on today's sort of accommodation topic on, on the traveling community. Like I said in, in, in a note that I sent forward, I think it's one of the better ones that I've I, I've been at. It has been it has been very depressing. I would I would go back over the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, you know, we shouldn't we shouldn't see uh, hot and such like Spring Lane, uh, which, which has been documented now at the minute to the Ombudsman. We need a president uh, to set and when when they're talking about 56 children in 2021, no child, uh, uh, you know, in Ireland should be able to live like that. So I, I'd like to thank the organisers once again uh, for putting on a very, very good show today. Well done. Thanks, Jim. OK, anybody else want to um, want to add? If you want to, you can use the, the um, reaction facility there if you want to raise your hands and then I'll try and follow them in order. Um, or it's just put in. Uh, Orla? Yeah, thanks very much. It's been very interesting and well done for all the work that's been done on this to Galway Travel Movement and everybody else. Um, I suppose I have a question. It's kind of a national question, maybe Bernard or somebody would be able to answer. And it's really about the National Housing Agency. Uh, there seems to be consensus that this is a re really one of the solutions for, you, you know, for something that's been going on for a long time. Um, it, it, are, have any concrete steps been taken around that or what Bernard do, or anybody else do you think are the steps towards achieving that? That's really the question. <laughs> Actually, could, could I get you, actually, Bernard, to hold on a sec, because we, we might get a few questions that then you could take. So if you just keep a note of that question about the housing agency, and then if we could just add a couple of others, it might just save us a couple of seconds. Anybody else want to add? And then if the speakers want to pick up a number of different points. If not. No. Okay, Bernard, it looks like you're up after all. <laughs> you're you're yeah, just on you yeah, I would, I would imagine everybody's kind of zoomed out now, but um, yeah, just to say to um, just around the um, independent traveller accommodation, I think um, Orla, um, where that's at is that the, uh, the department will be presenting a, a work plan for 2022, and in that they're now using a traffic light system, which will go in terms of, you know, green, orange, um, or red in terms of progress, and we've been pushing for timelines. But we do strongly believe that um, having an independent agency um, with oversight in terms of monitoring, implementation, um, targets, carrying out a national audit, like all of these have to be done in order to have oversight. Because I think in some ways, what we're seeing really is a system that's broken. And I think you mentioned that, Chris, already. So the system is already defunct, it's not working efficiently and effectively. Um, and I don't think the government can stand over the testimonies, the evidence, the, um, you know, and it's that nobody can just hide behind what's already been stated. And I know the government are not here to respond, but I know the previous minister had st stated again many times that, um, you know, more ne needs to be done. And I think there's, a, there's an opportunity now for this government to do the right thing. Um, in terms of resourcing the support and implementing the recommendations of the expert report 
Um, so I would see next year as an opportunity um, in order to advance um, that particular call. Great, Bernard. Thanks for that. Any other quick comments or questions? I'm just noting a message in the chat there that the, the, the solidarity and the cooperation is already beginning in the chat there, um, you know, between um, between the shift and Galway Traveller movement. So that's um, that's great to see. Uh, Saoirse, you want to? Yeah, it was just on Zim's point on the OCO report, no end in sight, um, and the fact that, you know, it, it could set a precedent for other sites. And just to note that the OCO, as part of the recommendation, said they would carry out a six month review and a 12 month review. And the six months is now up, so that review is ongoing. We don't know for sure whether the, the Ombudsman, Dr. Nal Muldoon, will publish his findings, I imagine he will, given the publicity that the report got, and we hope he does, because I think it's a real hook to monitor and hold the local authority accountable, but also government accountable. And it's certainly something we have been talking to the, the traveller organisations who are members of ours. We've been talking about this and how we can um, push forward those recommendations as well. So just to say that I don't think that that's a report that's just going to sit in the shelf. I think that's one that, that we can look to and just try and, and push progress with. Great. Thanks, Yusha. Thomas? Uh, hi. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not on mute. No, I, um, I wrote down Leilani's quote from early on, when governments ignore you, that seems purposeful, right? And I think we need to remember that. I, I think we have spent far too much of our time focusing on, on local authorities and the failure of local authorities. No, no, they deserve that attention. They deserve that criticism. Um, but we've been letting the government and the department off the hook. Like the government and the department are knowing collaborators in that um, kind, kind of neglect and inaction. Um, and we've been soft on them. So we need to remember when governments ignore you, that seems purposeful. Kind of, they're very purposeful. They've been very purposeful for a very long time um, in relation to that. So, so I think we need to we need to work together kind of. I, I mean, I must admit my own ignorance. I wasn't even aware there was a UN Rapporteur for Minorities uh, and, and, until today, you know, so I learned that um, today and maybe take him up on the offer, you know, to get um, uh, like maybe one of the Traveller um, or Roma reps um, to speak to his committee if I un un understood him right. Um, and, and maybe get someone seeing this being organized uh, by the Galway Traveller Movement, you know, maybe get a speaker from Galway Traveller Movement um, to, to take up this opportunity um, on our behalf. And um, I mean, that's a question, like in our region, the, the Traveller Project in Cork City, Cork County and Kerry County, um, we submitted a complaint to the UN Rapporteur almost two years ago, you know, and, and we haven't got any further than an automated uh, acknowledgement kind of, uh, like maybe we need more, more of that, we need to, to talk to one another, you know, kind of, well, if, if that's all you get and you don't know who to contact in the UN, you know, how can you overcome that? Um, how can we learn from one another that we all work in solidarity? Um, but but be clear, like the governments aren't our allies, kind of like the um, the expert review is it's coming close to two and a half years now, and they've implemented very very little, and they've been in the media um, only within the last fortnight, I think. You know where the department said there are no plans to um, to introduce a national traveller accommodation agency. And um, we know of the opposition from the Department of Justice and the Gardaí to the criminal trespass legislation. Um, so, so I just think we need to, to strengthen our efforts um, to, to, like, to fight all of that. Like, I mean, there's probably a handful of allies we have within governments and the permanent government uh, structures and build our alliances there. Um, but I just think we, we have let them off the hook for far too long. Okay, Thomas, thank you for that. I think it's an important point to note that there are often allies within the public administration system, whether it's in local government or whether it's in national government, and, and that and these, the, these allies need to be worked with. Um, okay, I think we might just cut the questions there if we can. Um, I know some people are having to leave, and we'll just hand over to um, Anne-Marie, who's going to present some of the GTM solutions. This, this won't take us too long. Okay, Back to um, you, Anne-Marie. Okay. 
thank you, uh, Chris, and um, thank you, Chris, and thank you again to all our speakers and for your valuable input. It was so important as part of of uh, the Travel Homes Now Galway Accommodation Inquiry, and uh, I, I we are really honoured for the input you have given us here today. And we'll move on now to, and it's the right to housing solutions and planning by design. This is the ask, this is the demand that the members of the Galway uh, traveller community are making. Well, and we're speaking, I suppose, for, for the traveller community uh, nationally also. It's planning by design for minorities to develop a more inclusive intercultural society. The conditions must be created to ensure interaction, understanding, equality of opportunity and respect. Planning should be about inclusion by design, not as an add on or an afterthought. By accepting this, we support the uh, concept that one size does not fit all. It is about both mainstream action and targeted strategies aimed at getting results and meeting minority needs. And we'll move on. And the special asks are deliver on all the benchmarks as detailed by the Traveller Homes Now inquiry. Independent survey to be carried out on the accommodation preferences of the traveller community in Galway and County. Prioritise the needs of the 322 traveller children living on the 18 sites and group housing schemes who need a future they, they can look forward to. Carry out an independent children's equality impact assessment and, and work with IREC and call for annual equality audits. It is not sufficient for the public body alone to define their duties. The traveller community needs to be consulted and part, part of any audit carried out. Leadership from the state, leadership from city and county managers, accountability and sanctions for lack of delivery, end the human rights violation and pro protect traveller children's rights. So thank you again and thank you everyone for your valuable input and thank you for everyone that took part in, in our inquiry today. Thanks, Anne-Marie. And I think just to finish, we were going to invite people to put some comments or messages of solidarity into the chat. And then I'm just going to do some very final comments, maybe while that's going on. So, Ali, is that that's all right? I think that's where we were going to go, wasn't it? Yeah. Or if we still if we could just do that in our last moments, we've actually got I'm going to put a link into the chat and everyone who still has the energy, if you just um, click on this link and um, if that doesn't work, then you can also go to menti.com. Uh, on a second device like your phone and put in this number and you'll see there that uh, we just would love to ask you what are your words of solidarity in action for the Traveller Homes Now campaign and we'd like to collect all of those and just have a sense of that support as we go forward. Um, okay so maybe just while, while people are doing that just some some comments to um to wrap up and one thing that struck me during the day I suppose if we we're really talking about a situation of lack of progress in the delivery of um, accommodation for travellers. And we have to really ask, you know, why is this the case? Is it a lack of policy? It certainly isn't the lack of funding. Is it um, weaknesses in the planning system? It certainly seems to be a lack of political will. And um, more seriously, is there a lack of administrative will to actually address this in a way? And I'm struck by the comments around, um, you know, uh, about, uh, and, and Fernand's comments earlier on about differences of treatment and things being seen as not normal as opposed to differently normal. They're perfectly normal. They're perfectly normal for the traveler community. They're just differently normal. That doesn't make them abnormal or not normal, um, but they are just differently, differently normal. Um, or is there a more fundamental issue here about lack of, lack of disposition, lack of administrative will or a more negative disposition? Um, and in some ways, and this has been highlighted by sociologists over years, um, that if in some way minority communities are treated like some kind of a moral underclass, then it becomes justifiable for administrators in some cases or politicians to treat them in some way that they don't deserve, um, that their human rights 
are protected, that they don't deserve to have a decent um, standard of accommodation, that they don't deserve to be able to look forward to the future with optimism. And I'm particularly struck by the children that we've talked about today and whether or not those children can look forward with optimism. Um, now, if disposition is lacking and if a positive will is lacking, well, then can that be addressed? Um, and how can that be addressed? And it's not an easy thing to address because that disposition is deeply ingrained in the majority of settled people who work in public administration. And as one of them, you know, have to you know, say that, you know, we, we've all, uh, you know, encountered that socialization and that ingraining of attitudes. And now, if that dis disposition can be addressed, well, then there needs to be consequences when it's not addressed. So if we don't behave in a way that is morally required for us to behave in a way, well, then we have to be held to account when we don't do that. Or if that doesn't work, well, then the responsibility has to be removed to someplace where that disposition is present. And I suppose this is where the argument for a national travel accommodation um, agency and body is, 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 you know, is so valid and so necessary. Because if you look at the Department of Housing now, and if you look at the existing housing agency and try to find evidence of the public sector human rights and equality duty, you will struggle to find it because I've been looking for it for the last few weeks um, and it's not there. What I wanted to share with you was just one quotation at the end from a publication from an American group of authors around social justice. And they make this point that social groups are sorted into a hierarchy that confers advantage, status, resources, access and privilege that are denied to those, uh, are denied or rationed to those lower in the hierarchy. I'm just going to put this into the chat. I'm not going to dwell on these, but I just wanted to leave, leave you with them. Power and uh, social groups are sorted into a hierarchy that confers advantage, status, resources, access and privilege that are denied or rationed to those lower in the hierarchy. And crucially, the power hierarchies may create and maintain systems um, of advantage and disadvantage that's based on social group membership. So this isn't accidental. This isn't the fault of travelers. This is because power hierarchies exist in society and they protect themselves. Um, and in some way then, Dominant groups hold the power and they want to keep the power. And I, I don't apologize to saying this to um, anybody here who is in positions of power, that dominant groups hold the power and authority to control in their own interests, the important institutions in society that determine how resources are allocated. And crucially, they define what is natural, good and true. Travelers been forced to live in standard housing against their will that isn't culturally appropriate is not natural, it's not good, and it's not true. And I suppose that is the fundamental ide ide ideational bit here that needs to be challenged, and it's the fundal underlying ideology that needs to be overcome, um, I suppose, if the type of campaign that we're looking at here today needs to be successful. Um, uh, and on that little rant at the end, <laughs> um, I think we're going to leave it at that. I'm just going to hand over to Anne-Marie to do final wrap-up comments. Yeah, and just to say to you both, Anne-Marie and Chris, that we have had many words of support coming in. So if you want to have a moment of, of seeing those uh, as you close, then, then I can yeah, share you, that. Can you? Do you want to yes, share that? Yes, shall I just bring that up now? Brilliant. and then? Yeah, um, that'd be great. Um, so yeah, I'll just bring it up. So yeah, so Chris and Anne-Marie, you can see some of the words that are there if you want to reflect on them. And thank you to everyone for really sharing your voices with us today, as so many of our speakers have shared theirs. Okay, so just to just to share, just to say that like the comments there, like shocking, uh, things have to change, solidarity. These are a few of the comments uh, that are coming in, like, and it's so important that we do have solidarity and also meaningful collaboration between local authorities and ourselves, the Galway Traveller Movement and all, tra all uh, traveller agencies within the country. And also very important, we have allies such as the Children's Rights Alliance. We have UN different officials from different platforms who have taken time out of their schedule and have given an input. Like it's very, very important if we want to bring about real change for travelers in Ireland, that accommodation is, 
it is one of the social uh, the detriments of health. Accommodation is so so valuable and so important to our overall sense of well being, and. This has been a very, very important uh, inquiry here today. And again, thank you again to our speakers, to my fellow chair for his wonderful comments and input, and to all and to Ali as well for making it all go along so smoothly. So I'd like to thank you all and hope keep up, keep uh, the fight going for traveller accommodation. Thanks, everyone. Thank so, Thanks, everybody. Take do you want care. to come off mute, say goodbye? We're so glad you're with us and goodbye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Fantastic Bye. event. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you. Bye. 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 Great. Thanks, everybody. That was great. Yeah. Memory. Very well. Very well. Well, uh, apologies if we, we 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 ran a little bit over, but it just seemed um not they didn't want to lose the, the time for questions there at the um. Oh, I'm very good. good. Just invite some of the last people to leave. Thanks so much for being here, and then we can maybe um check in as a as a team. Um, and uh, yeah. So goodbye. Um, just uh, invite a few people to leave. Um, and Tanya, that's great. I saw you came in uh, later on. It's great that you were with us. Um, we're still live on Facebook. Apparently. We're still live on Facebook. And thank you to everyone on Facebook. So um, with that, I will um, end our live stream and say goodbye.